Hey everybody, welcome to my home office. You'll notice it's in black and white, not because my office is black and white, but because it's kind of a green color and at night it looks kind of like pea soup and I don't want you associating nausea or pea soup with music history. So I've chosen black and white. Um, I've got a couple of things we need to go through beforehand and I am just going to do this in one take. So I'm hoping there aren't too many mistakes that I make. Please bear with me. I'm burning the midnight oil trying to get this video lecture done and make sure that it's ready for you to use and engage with while I'm gone at my conference. So thanks for watching. Thanks for being patient. And if you have any questions after the video, please don't hesitate to email me. I will have access to email and I should be able to check it pretty regularly. All right, so the first thing that you'll notice is on your syllabus, there are four pieces for today. We're going to take one out. I simply have run out of time to create all the materials for those four pieces. So we're going to take out number 191. This means the numbers that you need to know are 190, it's a piece by Villa Lobos, 193, a piece by Henry Cowell, and 194, a piece by Ruth Crawford Seeger. What you might want to do right now is get your anthology, make sure you have that handy because I'm going to reference the scores a couple of times and it would be good for you to be able to flip through those. You might also want to pull up some recordings. I'm going to give you spots to pause and I'm going to encourage you to listen during those pauses. So if you have the CDs, you can play those. Or if you want to play a YouTube link, there's one YouTube link that I'm going to send you uh, for the Banshee. So you should have that one on Blackboard. The others you may or may not have on CD, so you might want to use YouTube recordings. So you might want to go ahead and pull those things up so you have those ready and you don't have to go searching for them. I do have a handy dandy sign I've made, so at appropriate moments I'm going to hold it up. While I'm here I'll count to five. That should give you time to pause and gather what you need and that way I don't steamroll ahead of you. So let's take the first pause now. You can pause the video and you're gonna grab your anthology. You're gonna pull up any recordings that are applicable. One of them is on Blackboard for the Banshee, but you're probably going to need a recording for the Ruth Crawford Seeger piece, again, number 194, and a recording for the Villa Lobos piece, again, 190. So here's the pause. I feel real dorky doing that, but I think it'll work. So, first piece of music that I'm going to have you engage with is the piece by Vila Lobos. This is on page 429 of your anthologies, so go ahead and turn to 429. And I'll give you a little background while you're doing that. When you get to the piece, you'll notice that the title is Bacchianas Brasileiras. And two things should really jump out at you. You should see Bach in Bachianas. You should see something that looks like Brazil in Brasileiras. These are the two things that I want you to focus on when you're working on your worksheet. A little bit about the composer. Vila Lobos is a Brazilian composer. The Oxford Dictionary of Music actually calls him, and I'm quoting, the single most significant creative figure in 20th century Brazilian art music. End quote. So take that for what you will. Vila Lobos' father was an amateur musician. He taught Vila Lobos how to play the cello, and then Vila Lobos did a lot of self learning, so he taught himself quite a lot about music. Vila Lobos was friends with Mio. He also went to Europe in 1923 and decided to settle in Paris a few years later. He really went over to publicize himself, not to study. There are a lot of composers that go over to study in Europe at the beginning of the 20th century, but Villa Lobos is not really going to study. He's going really to go make a name for himself. And while he's there, he meets quite a few composers, including Ravel, Stravinsky, and Prokofiev. When we think about Bacchianas Brasileiras, there are a couple of things that we should keep in mind. And perhaps the most important thing is to keep in mind that these works were not intended to be stylized renditions of the music of Bach. 
So it's not supposed to be a stylized rendition. It's not supposed to be copying the music of Bach. But it's an attempt to adapt a number of Baroque harmonic and Baroque contrapuntal procedures freely to Brazilian music. So in a way, Vila Lobos is trying to mesh the two together. You'll notice, if you're looking at the title, that this is the fifth Bacchianas Brasileiras. I think it says Bacchianas Brasileiras number five. There are a total of nine of them, and each of these are designed like a suite. Some have fewer movements, like the one we're looking at has two movements, and we're going to look at the first. Um, others have more movements. Each of the movements in all, the, all, all of the Bacchianas Brasileiras, all of them have a dual title. So if you are looking again at the title on page 429, you should see aria and cantilena. So the aria is more of a reference to traditional Baroque genres. Bach did write arias. The cantilena is supposed to lean more toward a Brazilian national genre. And when you look up cantilena, this is what you'll find. It's a term used for a particularly sustained or lyrical vocal line, usually for solo voice, it means lullaby in Italian. The Italian verb cantilenare also means to hum, and this wordless quality can also be important. So that's one of the first things that you'll notice before you even listen is the Bacchianas Brasileiras, the Bach part, the Brazil part. It's reflected in the names of each of the individual movements, the aria cantilena that we have here. So what I'd like you to do now is to listen to the piece, and then I'd like you to do the first part of your worksheet. This is a little bit more involved with the anthology, meaning I'm going to ask you to listen and then consider what elements sound more like Bach or might relate more to what Bach would have done or Baroque ideas, and then what elements can connect more clearly to Brazil. One list will be a lot shorter than the other, so if you feel like you're not coming up with a lot for one list, that's okay. I don't want to tell you which one, because then it would just make the assignment too easy, right? So go ahead and take a pause now. Listen and think about the first part of your worksheet. When you're done, come back and we'll talk about another piece. Okay, second piece for today. It's number 193. You'll find that on page 475 of your anthologies. The title of this work is the Banshee. You must say it like that because it's just much more exciting or foreboding. It's by, a Pete's, no, 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 it's by a man named Henry Cowell, and the work is supposed to evoke the spirit of a banshee. A banshee is an Irish mythical spirit that is an omen of death. It's a female spirit that either wails or shrieks or keens to herald the death of a family member. This piece that we are looking at is perhaps the most famous example of Henry Cowell exploring new techniques. He really spends a lot of his career exploring new sounds. So before I give you any other information about the work, I'd like you to stop, listen to the work now. This is the one where I provided a link on Blackboard. It's on the exam three folder, if you haven't pulled it up yet. So again, I'm gonna give you the pause sign and I want you to listen to the Banshee now. If you want to try to follow along with the score, it starts on page 475 of your anthologies. I believe that's actually the instructions, and then the music is on page 476. So again, another pause. I think you might have just heard my dog bark. Pardon my dog if she does that again. Or at least I heard her barking. Probably somebody very dangerous outside. All right. I hope while you were watching, you noticed a couple of things. First of all, it should be pretty obvious that the pianist is playing the inside of the piano, playing the strings on the inside. And she used different motions to create the sounds. Now, I put a piece of paper here so that I can demonstrate a little bit. Uh, there are four general types of sounds that she is creating, or whoever is playing this piece is creating. So, this is my 
handy dandy sheet here. If you can imagine that these are the strings inside of the piano, I'm going to show you uh, the four different ways that you create the sound. Okay, so the first way is using the flesh of your finger, so like the pad of your finger, and going across the strings, so you're actually going perpendicular to the way that the strings are laid out in the piano. The second way is to use the flesh of the finger again, and you're going to move it along the length of the string. This is a vertical movement, so you would be going probably with your finger more like this, up this way, or down. I guess it depends on where you're located <laughs> in the piano. I think it would actually be going down. The third way is to use your fingernail, and then do the same sort of motion along the length of the string. That was really helpful, wasn't it? <laughs> and then the fourth way to create the sound is actually by plucking the strings. Now there's a question on your worksheet that asks you to consider the directions on the front page, page 475, and think about which one you would find most difficult to do. So I'm going to give you another pause to think about answering that particular question. It's the first one for this particular piece, the Banshee. We'll come back to that second question a little bit later. The piece requires very obviously one player for the inside of the piano. But often there's a second person. Uh, you have one person playing on the inside, but you need someone sitting at the bench to hold the pedal. If it was me, I would definitely like to use a person because there's less room for error. Another option would be is to, to put something heavy on the pedal. But my fear would be that somehow it would move. Like I would bump the piano and like a book would fall off or a brick. It probably isn't that risky, but in my head it somehow seems risky. So you may have two people, one person sitting at the piano, or you can have something heavy holding down that pedal. But the pedal has to be held down because if it's not, the sound's going to be lost. It's going to be very soft. You're not really going to be able to hear anything. The pedal catching all of the sound is actually very crucial. The work, as you noticed, also requires a new type of notation. So in your score, you should have noticed letters in the actual music that were keyed to brief instructions for each kind of playing technique. If you look at the score some more, you might also see that Henry Cowell is organizing the piece into four short sections. Each of the sections is articulated by a plucked idea. I've got my anthology here, so when I am looking at it, uh, the first time you'll see this is in measure eight, and you'll actually see what looks more like notes with rhythm, and those are the plucked notes. It happens again in measure 20, and then again in measure looks like 33. So those are the dividing spots. The plucked ideas help divide or articulate each section. Articulate, ha, ah, because you're plucking. Sorry, you can't escape the bad jokes. So, if you're thinking about each section, the first section is mostly quiet, the second section grows louder, it introduces fingernail rubs, that sort of screechy sound. The third section is louder still with many more of those fingernail rubs, and then the last section is quiet again. And in this way it helps represent this mythical banshee creature approaching, creating sound, intensifying the sound, and then the subsiding of the sound and the banshee leaving. On your assignment, the next question regarding the banshee asks you to tell me whether you think that Cowell's music better depicts wailing, shrieking, or keening. Because if you look up the definition of banshee, all three of these are given as possibilities. So in order to think about this, you're going to have to give me definitions of all three words. That way I know you've considered all three of them. Uh, so once you give those definitions, I want you to tell me which of those words you think best describes the music that you're hearing, and obviously give me an explanation why. So I'll give you another pause here so that you can start working on that part.
Okay, the last piece that we are going to consider together is a lot more theory heavy. So I'm going to try to be as specific as possible. I've also put a handout up on Blackboard that I think will be very helpful. I'll give you another pause to find that as we are working on this piece, but just be aware that it's coming. So, the last piece is by a woman named Ruth Crawford Seeger. It's her string quartet from 1931. It's on page 479 of your anthologies. I want to give you just a little bit of information again about the composer. If we go back into the previous decade, into the 1920s, because I mentioned her string quartet is from 1931, Ruth Crawford Seeger's career was flourishing. She was really well respected in several modernist circles, though the circles weren't very big. Pretty small communities, small circles, but she was very well respected in these circles. She was also friends with Henry Cowell. We just looked at his piece, The Banshee. She worked with him. He published some of her music, so they had uh, a relationship. Not a romantic relationship, but a working relationship. At this time, when she is writing her string quartet in 1931, she is identifying as a modernist. Later, she identifies as an ultra-modernist. And this is the vocabulary word you'll want to write down. Ultra-modernist. Uh, if you need it spelled, U-L-T-R-A-M-O-D-E-R-N-I-S-T. Ultra-modernist. This is a person, a composer, focused on developing new musical resources. And we're going to talk about what that means in the context of this piece, because it is really something you can also apply to this piece of music. String Quartet 1931 was composed by Ruth Crawford Seeger during a year in Berlin slash Paris. She was on a Guggenheim Fellowship at the time, and she actually secluded herself, which is quite interesting. She avoided contact with other composers. She did not study with anyone, kind of like Vila Lobos going over and not studying with anyone, but I think Ruth Crawford Seeger was even more isolated. Uh, she intentionally avoided Schoenberg, at the time. She met only very briefly with Berg and with Bartok, so she really is working a lot on her own. Her quartet, if we think about it as a whole quartet, has four movements. That's expected. We have a fast movement to start, we have a scherzo for a second movement, third movement is slow, and then the last movement again is fast. And each movement is based on a different set of devices, many of which have not been tried before. So this would be a really good time to go ahead and get that handout, couldn't think of the word, from Blackboard. So I'm going to give you another pause. Again, it's in the folder exam three. And to be honest, I'm making the video first and posting it later. So it's probably titled something like Ruth Crawford Seeger or Seeger String Quartet, something to do with her name, and then String Quartet 1931. We're going to dive into the last movement, that last fast movement, and we're going to note the different devices that Seeger uses. They're all listed on your handout. This is what it looks like. Hopefully you've got that pulled up on your computer. I've just noticed it's backwards. So what you are seeing is probably reverse of what you've got. So I will reference this, but I'm probably not going to hold it up a lot because that would be confusing. Right now, what I'd like you to do before we do any more talking, though, is listen to the movement. And it's really important that you look at the anthology for this one while you're listening because we're going to be talking about things that we're seeing in the score. So it's really going to help you out if you've actually listened with the music in front of you. So here is, I believe, our last pause. Okay. The first thing that I would like you to notice, it's kind of at the top of your handout. It's where the two arrows are coming together like this. We have another instance of palindrome in this piece by Ruth Crawford Seeger. So the mirror point is measure 58-59. So go ahead and flip there. I'm going to kind of mimic flipping as well since I'm asking you to look for things in your anthology. 
Okay, I've got there. Measures 58 to 59. What you should see are two whole notes in all of the instruments, and they are tied together. And they're tied over the bar line. If we read backwards in the violin, so first violin, these are the notes that you should see going from the midpoint backwards. G, C sharp, F sharp, F natural, A, E flat, A flat. Now if we take all of those notes up a half step and start with the C sharp, you will have this set. You might want to write it down. We're taking again the notes that we just read and moving them up a half step. So, starting with the C sharp, C sharp becomes D, the next would become G, the next F sharp, the next A sharp, E, and then A. Now what I have done is I have taken the notes that you would expect to be mirrored exactly and I've raised them all a half step. So if you look at your music, at measure 60, I'm going to read that same set of new pitches again. Look at the first violin part. You should see D, G, F sharp, A sharp, E, and A. So what Ruth Crawford Seeger has done is not a literal reflection. We don't have the midpoint and then have the exact same notes over here in reverse that we had over here. What happens is we have the notes that come up to the midpoint, and then when we reverse, we raise everything a half step up. So when you are looking, excuse me, at your arrows on the handout, you'll notice that the arrows that represent the first half, the arrow that represents the first half of the piece comes in like this, and then the arrow that represents the other half of the piece is up to represent that we've moved up a half step. Hopefully that visual helps. The second thing that I'd like you to notice, and also to be able to explain, is the nature of the first violin line. So not just the part that we looked at. You do need to be able to talk about that. That's the first big thing. The second big thing, we'll go back to the beginning and look again at the first violin part. So I have flipped back to the beginning, to page 479. And if you're looking at the first violin part, you're going to see in the very first measure, one note. One. Then you're going to go to the next measure and you're going to see two notes. When you get to measure six, when the first violin plays again, you're going to have three notes. So you should notice that I'm adding a number each time. Every time the violin plays up to that midpoint, that mirror point, it adds a note. So it starts with one note. By the time we get to the middle, we have 21 notes in the first violin part. Now, as you're looking, please beware, because if you would continue looking on the first page, the next entrance, where we would expect to see four notes, that's going to be measures 9 and 10. If you are looking at the music very quickly, you will look and you'll see five note heads, but the second and third note head are tied together, so you are actually only playing four notes. So just be aware sometimes you have ties so it may look like you have more notes because of the note heads but you have ties uh, that actually make it very clearly one note, two notes, three notes, four notes, five notes. We're just adding one um, we're adding one note in the sense of playing a note each time. Also if you're looking at the violin part You'll notice that every time it plays, it adds a note, but the notes don't have to be the same. So the pitches can vary. The rhythms can also vary. They can be different values. I also want you to note that the first violin begins with double sforzando, so it's loud. If you turn to measure, f excuse me, <laughs> yeah, measure 48, going back to about that midpoint, Right before the first violin gets to the middle, measure 48, the dynamics are pianissimo. So what happens over the course of the first half is the violin 
gradually gets softer. It's like a long day crescendo. Okay, so if you go to your handout, I've tried to make these three things really clear. So you'll notice the first violin, it adds a note each time that it plays in terms of the number of notes it's playing. It also decrescendos over the first half, so it goes from very loud at the beginning to pianissimo at the midpoint. And then I also mentioned that the pitches and the rhythms of the notes that the violin plays, the first violin, are freely chosen. They're varied. They are not bound by any rules. All right? Got the first violin down? Okay, let's move on to the other instruments. So, the third thing I'd like you to be able to notice and explain is the nature of the other strings. So, flip back to the beginning, page 479. The other three strings, this is a string quartet, so I'm talking about the second violin, the viola, and the cello. They play in unison, so they're functioning together. If you look at the first time that they make any sound in this movement, they have 20 pitches, 20 notes. The second time they play, they have 19 notes, and then 18, and then 17. You can count them if you like. Um, but it's the reverse of what we have in the first violin. The other strings go from many notes to only one note at the midpoint. If you look at their dynamics, the other strings, they start pianissimo, and then if you flip to the middle, their last note, right before that midpoint, it's a sforzando, and then it does go down to piano. But um, before that, in measure 54, everything is very loud. So they're doing the opposite again. They're going from soft at the beginning to louder. Their pitches and rhythms are also determined. So this is where you need to refer to the bottom of your handout. Listen carefully. Make sure that you're looking at your handout so that this makes sense. The simple part is the rhythm. Sorry to have you keep going back and forth. Uh, but again, go back to page 479. Look at the other strings, the second violin, the cello, the viola. They are always playing eighth notes. So they don't get to freely choose their rhythms. They have very exact eighth notes all the time. The one exception is the midpoint when they have a sustained note and everybody is actually playing that sustained note together, that mirror point, right? At measure, we talked about it earlier, measures 58 to 59. Now, the pitches they play. This is actually a very designed pitch collection. So again, have your handout ready. At the bottom, you should notice what's called a rotation of a 10-note series. So I know this is backwards, but we're talking about this part at the bottom, right here. And what you'll notice is the first line starts out with the pitches D, E, F, E flat, so on and so forth. So what happens? If you look at your music, look at page 479. The first notes that are played are those 10 notes in the first line, D, E, F, E flat, so on and so forth. When it gets to the end, the final pitch of C, that's at the beginning of measure four. And then what happens, the next note is E. What Ruth Crawford Seeger has done is she has taken the first note and now moved it to the end. So again, at the risk of, I know it looks backwards, but she takes that first note and then moves it to the end. So you should see that D now has moved to the end. So now she goes through this set. Then when she gets done with that, she takes the first letter E and moves it to the end. So she's rotating through the pitches. It's a rotation of a 10 note series. So she does the series, then takes the first note, moves it to the end, and then goes through it again takes the first note and moves it to the end, does it again. So it's not just a repetition of the same 10 notes over and over again, but you're rotating through them and actually changing what note comes first, and that gives it a little bit more variety, but everything is very strictly controlled. So again, these three things that are associated with the other string instruments in the quartet are on your handout. 
I've been pointing to the graphic I have about the 10 note series, that rotation. So that's the first thing, the rotation of the 10 note series. And all the time that we have those other strings playing, they're always playing eighth notes. Then I have that graphic that shows that we start soft in the other strings and then crescendo. So it goes from soft to loud. At the midpoint, it's loud. And then it gets quiet again to the end. Long crescendo, then second half is a long day crescendo. And then also the number of notes that are being played gets smaller as we go to the midpoint. 20, 19, 18, so on until we get to one. And then it goes the other direction. So really, the first violin is doing one thing, and it's like the second violin, the viola, and the cello are doing the opposite at the same time, and they're stacked one on top of the other. Actually, the, yeah, that makes sense, one on top of the other. First violin at the top, and then the other three instruments below. Okay, so there are some final questions to wrap up the Ruth Crawford Seeger piece. I'm not going to ask you to repeat any of the information I've given you on the worksheet, but you do need to be able to answer questions that I would ask about the structure of this piece. This would be a great question for the final. This would be a great question for the final. Hint, hint. Not only so I know that you have watched the video and that you get the concept, um, I think I said not only, but I don't know how I want to in that sentence. I want you to be able to tell me about the structure by asking a question on the final. I would know that you have watched the video and that you've engaged with this piece. So it serves a couple of different functions. Okay, so I'm not going to give you the pause sheet again because I am done with my video lecture. But now what I would like you to do is go ahead and finish your worksheet. If you want to turn it in Tuesday by class, that'd be great. Um... But if you want to save it until Tuesday at 5, you're free to do that, and you can send it in by email. All right. Again, if you have any questions while you're working on the worksheet, shoot me an email, and I will try to answer it as quickly as possible. It is due by 5 o'clock on Tuesday, April. I have to double check. Tuesday, April 17th. But if you get it done early and would like to send would like to give me the paper copy in class, that would also be great because I'm going to print them all off anyway so I can write comments on them. All right, I hope you enjoyed your Thursday off. I will see you guys on Tuesday.